Okay, so I'm hoping I'm not the only person in the room today old enough to remember a time when this was just about the smartest phone that you could hope to buy. A time before the internet. A mythical time. Well, for those of, it, both of us that do, we'll probably remember that things were a little different. Particularly the way we access and share information, knowledge, services. Things were a lot more centralised and generally a lot harder to find. For example, I remember when our family got its first PC. It looked something like this. <coughs> Chunky, no internet connection. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'd never heard of the internet. But the point is that when something went wrong or we needed to know something about this computer, even something pretty simple, we had to go directly to the manufacturer to find out. We'd spend two hours on the phone trying to get through to them, at the end of which you'd get through to somebody who'd ask you, have you tried switching it off and switching it back on again? <laughs> but this is kind of how everything was, right? I mean, if we needed to find out about a train time we wanted to catch, or a hotel booking we wanted to make, you had to go directly to those centralised sources of knowledge. And now, well, not that many years later, we've completely revolutionised the way that we do this, the way that we access knowledge and services. It's gone from that centralised model to being able to find things within seconds online, often from people that we've never met before, sometimes from countries that we've never even been to. But the change here is not in people's expertise or their knowledge. That's always been there. The change, the fundamental shift that we've made, is in the way that we connect them together. And some of the biggest game changers of our time, from eBay to Wikipedia, Khan Academy to Uber, have taken this idea of somebody with a gap or a need, and somebody else with a resource, and connecting them together, to fundamentally decentralize knowledge and change the way that we live. But if these models are so powerful, if crowdsourcing can make such a big difference, why don't we use it more in the developing world? We know, I mean, it's universally accepted that access to information, to knowledge, to ideas is one of the key drivers in lifting people out of poverty. But if you think about the way that we do international development projects, the way that we impact communities around the world, we very rarely promote crowdsourcing models, certainly at any scale. But why? Well, one of the reasons is probably fairly obvious to just about everybody, right? There's no internet. We know that 90% of people that live in communities like this in <coughs> Africa have no access at all to online tools. But I spent 10 years of my life working in international development in communities across Africa and Latin America. And that experience told me that perhaps there's a second reason. And one that's a bit more fundamental and I think worth acknowledging. And that is, however subconsciously, we tend to think that poor people just need to be told what to do. That's the way that we help people. There are hundreds of organisations, from NGOs to governments that work in this space, training, education, knowledge, but virtually all of them come at this from a top-down perspective. We will decide the training that is needed, we'll develop it, and then we'll give it to you. We'll decide the knowledge that you need to know, and we'll collect it all together and impart it to you. That's the way this works. But despite a career spent in international development, it wasn't until I wanted to set up our own crowdsourcing tool, we farm with farmers, that I actually realized the true depth of skepticism that many people have to this kind of model, to grassroots knowledge. Now, um, <coughs> this type of knowledge is extremely important. I understand where people's skepticism comes from. When we started this, we were out to, to just about everywhere that we could partner with the NGOs and the governments, and overwhelmingly, the reaction that we got was extreme skepticism. People were incredulous that we would even attempt this madness. How could these rural, isolated people possibly have anything useful to share with each other? Truly, that's what we're here for. But we wanted to build this. I understand where the skepticism comes from. It comes from a genuine desire to help, to protect. But ultimately, my opinion is, 
that these kind of paternalistic attitudes are well, not healthy, and they certainly don't live, uh, don't result in the long term to the impact that we want to see in communities. We need to build marketplaces and economies of people's own resources and knowledge, something that's sustainable. And that's what we set out to do. With WeFarm, we decided to work with the 500 million small-scale farmers around the world that have no access to the internet. We thought that if you could harness the skills, the experiences, the grassroots solutions of that community and make it available to everybody else, that you could achieve something pretty powerful and impactful. And let's be honest, not just for them, but for all of us. These farmers grow 70% of all the food we eat on Earth. If they don't grow it, we don't eat it. So we built it, and we launched it last year in Kenya, and the concept is pretty simple. Build a network that allows these same farmers that don't have internet to access and share vital information without leaving a farm or spending any money. And this is an example of how it works. So meet Victor. Victor is a tea farmer in Kenya, and his tea plants were being attacked by a pest, a bug that he'd never seen before, and it was destroying his livelihood. So he sends a free, simple SMS, a text message, to the local WeFarm number outlining his problem. WeFarm takes that content, analyzes it, and decides on the two or three people in the network that have the best information to help. In this example, Victor's question arrived with Doris via SMS. <coughs> Now, Doris is also a tea farmer, but in Uganda, and she'd be dealing with this same pest every day of her life for the last 10 years. So who better to start providing relevant and useful information with Victor? And that's the ethos, to build on people's grassroots knowledge. We think that farmers agree, because more than 100,000 of them have joined in the first year, and they've shared more than 14 million pieces of grassroots knowledge but these kind of networks also have other effects. Harnessing the voice of the people at scale can have some pretty powerful pieces of information. Every government, every NGO, every community organization on earth wants to do projects based on the real needs of the people they work with. But how do you know? In most of the disconnected world, literally the only way to find this out is to go in with a clipboard and a pencil and ask people. But what if you could harness the voice of this society to give real insight? This shows something pretty simple. It's the difference in the challenges faced by women farmers in Kenya and women farmers in Uganda. Something pretty simple, but I think something pretty powerful. This is the kind of information that can help the governments and the NGOs that work with these communities, not to mention the communities themselves to know what's really going on. And the key difference is, this is the challenges expressed by those women themselves, over 50 or 100,000 of their own questions, rather than us deciding what the challenges are for them. We sometimes are a little skeptical about data tracking and analysis in the Western world and some of the horror stories on social networks. But what if, instead of trying to sell you that flight that you were searching for five minutes ago, you could use data to do some pretty fundamental and powerful things? Like start to map outbreaks of disease or drought based on the voice of the people. That's the kind of information that can help governments and NGOs to make game-changing impact across countries, and all of it based on that voice of your own community. Now I'm not going to stand here and try to pretend that networks and connecting people is the answer to every single problem. It's obviously not. We know from quite a few years of experience in the Western world the social networks have their problems too. And opening the door to pure source content means exactly that. We're opening a door. Through it will come everything from the good, the bad, the baffling, to the highly opinionated and things that other people probably don't think is important. But our argument is that that's precisely the point. A lot of this is about trust. Trust in people's own content, their own solutions, and trusting that they will know what to find and use themselves rather than us have to decide that for them. It's not the answer to every problem out there, but it does provide a realistic alternative for international projects and work. We know from the Western world 
that social networks, that connecting people can have some pretty powerful effects. It can get big ideas out there. It can help to, to transmit things around the world in seconds. We think that if you empower people everywhere around the world to share their ideas, their questions, their answers, their concerns, then we can achieve something powerful. We think it's time that the other half of the world's population, the unconnected half, had this part too. Thank you.